Hi, welcome to Head Start, the podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. In a previous episode of the podcast with guest Brian Smith of P3R, we saw how it is possible for even a very large race like the Pittsburgh Marathon to achieve zero waste status. That is the goal of diverting more than 90% of total race waste away from landfill. But what about carbon emissions? Is it equally feasible to aspire towards carbon neutrality? That is to say, putting on an event with net zero or perhaps even negative carbon footprint? Well, that's what we'll be discussing today with my guest, Porter Bratton, owner of Washington-based Blackfish Ventures and a passionate practitioner of sustainability in all the races he puts on. We're going to be looking at what makes up a race's carbon footprint, how to formulate a practically achievable carbon mitigation strategy, and how carbon offsetting can help bridge the gap to carbon neutrality when further improvements in lowering carbon emissions may not always be possible. Like the previous discussion on achieving zero waste, today's chat is very much focused on practical wins races and race directing teams of all sizes can confidently work towards. So, if you've thought about making your race more sustainable and have been struggling with taking your first steps towards that goal, stick around. There's plenty in this conversation that should help you do that. Before we get into all that, though, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our amazing podcast sponsor, Run Sign Up, race director's favorite all in one technology solution for endurance and fundraising events. More than 26,000 in person, virtual, and hybrid events use Run Sign Up's free and integrated solution to save time, grow their events, and raise more. And we'll be hearing a bit more from this great company a little later in the podcast. But now, let's dive into carbon-neutral race production with Blackfish Ventures' Porter Bratton. Porter, welcome back to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for coming on. How are things in Anacortes, Washington? Well, they're great. I'm a dad and a race director, a uh, race owner. Life is pretty good. You guys uh, starting to get a little bit cold out there? Yeah, we had a real hot, uh, I call it hot em. It was like two two weeks ago, it was still like in the 70s. And now it's, you know, in the 40s. And so it's it's here, falls here. Do you guys continue to put on through the winter? Because I've seen some some sort of videos from the San Juans and stuff. You get quite a lot of snow up there. We don't get much snow here. We're at like 10 feet above sea level. Um, although ironically, the past two years we've had real intense cold snaps where it got down the teens last year, and the the sea actually uh, froze over a little bit, which was crazy. Um, but we have races throughout. Our last race is at the end of or the beginning of December, and then we kind of take a hiatus until February, so a little bit of a break. Okay, so I should have said your it's not your first time on the podcast, uh, hence the welcome back. So we had you and Tony Sapp. Almost a year ago, did an amazing episode on buying and selling races, one of our uh, most popular episodes to date. No surprise why. Cool. But still, lots of people may not know uh, much about you. So do you mind introducing yourself to folks just one more time? Of course. Yeah. My name is Porter Bratton. Uh, I live in Anacortes, Washington in the USA, and I have been putting on endurance events since 2010, full time. My company's name is Blackfish Ventures, and we have we actually have two brands in that company. One is called Orca Running, which is our road running brand, and the other is Evergreen Trail Runs, which is our trail racing, trail running brand. Um, and we've got about 25 events per year with about 15,000 participants. We've got two other owners who are great, and uh, that's, that's my full-time job, and it's a great job. It is indeed. Are you guys back to uh, 2019 levels yet? The trail races are all bigger than 2019. The road races were down this year on average about 5%. So I know that like, we, I was feeling pretty good about that because I know that from what I've seen, this industry standard seems to be more like 20 to 25%. So um, the fact that we're down only five was... In 2023, based upon the registration numbers so far, I think we'll, we'll finally get back above 2019 levels, which will be great. Yeah, I mean, trail running seems to be totally unstoppable, which I love because it's an um, it's an amazing sport. It's it's doing really great, isn't it? Yes, every road runner, or not every road runner, but I feel like most road runners have either tried it out or are curious about it and would like to try it out. But there's just something holding them back, whether it's access to trails or feeling a little nervous about trying it out, or maybe not having the right gear or something. But yeah, there does seem to be a lot of interest for most runners. 
with regards to the topic we're going to be discussing today, which is sort of part of the whole sustainability picture, trail running has also been sort of at the forefront of that. Like every new idea or like the commitment that I see from the from the trail racing community and trail race directors to sustainability really leads the way in all of this stuff, which is no surprise why you're here and why we're going to be doing, we're going to be going through all the very practical things you're doing in in trail running. But I sense that for you, it's this focus on sustainability, and we've discussed this before, is particularly something close to your heart. Is that the case? Yeah. I, I If I only had road races, I would still be doing the same things. Uh, and the reason that I have kind of made sustainability a big part of our races is, I, for me, more of a moral decision, because I have children, and they will have children. And even if I didn't have any kids, there will still be so many more people will be born uh, in the future. Like the the ratio of people who have been born to people who will be born is is tremendous. And I think it would be it would be cruel, you know, to not do what we can. It would not be it would not be morally right to uh, to not do what we can to leave them a planet that is not only inhabitable but you know is as pleasant as we have enjoyed. And so I, I think every company, every individual should be thinking about this. It can be overwhelming. And I, I'm sure we'll talk about that um, as we get into things, but it matters a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. And and you did a fantastic webinar actually for Unsign Up, which is sort of part of what we're going to be, same kind of um, ground we're going to be covering today on um, producing carbon neutral races. And And I thought it would be great to go over that for people listening in Because of the two, I guess, pillars to sustainability or the ones that are most easy to comprehend, which is reducing waste and reducing carbon, a lot more people get, I I think, are a lot more comfortable with the reducing waste part of it because they also do it in daily life, you know, recycling, all of that kind of stuff. But I'm not actually all that familiar with the carbon side of sustainability, which is is great to, to get into today. And I guess we can start with some really basic concepts, right? You hear in this kind of discussion, people speaking of a carbon footprint. Uh, And I guess everyone has a rough idea of what that is, but what would be your definition of what a carbon footprint is, perhaps in the context of a race that people may be more familiar with? Right. So a carbon footprint in the context of a race is a quantity of carbon dioxide and other compounds as well um, that are produced as a result of that race happening, and specifically those compounds that do contribute to climate change. So that's carbon dioxide, um, but there's lots of other things as well that pollute. I'm sure that you've heard about methane and how cows farting, you know, is really bad for the environment because the methane, which is related to what's called carbon dioxide equivalence. So, and that's basically saying that, you know, Um, You might be emitting a small amount of methane, but because it is much more polluting than carbon dioxide, it has a larger carbon dioxide equivalence. So one unit of methane, but it actually counts for 40 units of carbon dioxide, if that makes sense. So, yeah. So basically we're saying that uh, on the whole equivalence thing that a ton of methane released into the atmosphere does a lot more damage to global global warming and, and all of that stuff than just a ton of carbon dioxide. Right. So things are always measured in tons, metric tons specifically, of carbon dioxide, but it might actually be made up of quite a few different gases that are being uh, emitted. Right. So yeah, so the unit of measure on harm, on the harm that it does to the environment is sort of like metric tons of carbon dioxide worth of harm essentially. And and as you say, it can be carbon dioxide, it could be other kinds of stuff. And for a typical race, where do those kinds of emissions contributions come from? So like, where do the carbon dioxides and the methanes and all of that stuff come from? So for a race, our estimate is that about 80% comes from people driving to and from the race. The Council for Responsible Sport did an estimate as well. And their number for the race day transportation was much higher. I think it was well above 95%. So depending upon you know how you're estimating, uh, for the overwhelming majority comes from people driving to and from the race. Um, other things which are much smaller in comparison are going to be um, 
the swag, you know, the, your finisher medals or your shirts or whatever you have, food, anything that you're anything that's getting shipped as a part of the race, especially if it's a virtual race. And then, of course, your your waste. Right. So, I mean, I guess the driving to and from the race and we're not talking just race team here. We're talking obviously the predominance of that comes from participants, right? Driving and flying to the race. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you have you might have 10 or a dozen staff or you know, a thousand people. So the staff is a small fraction of the participants transport. Yes. Yeah. And, and I guess that's, that's quite straightforward. Like, you know, like you put, you put gas into the, into the car and then, or, or, you know, you put whatever, like jet fuel into the, into the airplane. It's pretty straightforward where the emissions come from there. When we're talking about things like shirts, where does the carbon in that come from? Basically, where's the contribution there? So this is probably a good time to bring up that there are three scopes to carbon emissions. One is when you're directly producing emissions. So let's say you're having a campfire or driving a car, you are directly producing carbon because things are being burned or combusted and it's being released into the air. And that is obviously driving would fall into that category. Second thing, purchase energy. So if you are using electricity for, for anything, and if that electricity is coming from you know, a fossil fuel powered power plant, then you are producing emissions as well. And that is part of the swag equation because electricity was used to make it. Um, and then the third is what is the most nebulous and kind of hard to calculate. And it's what's called, it's got a very technical name of indirect value chain emissions. And so that can be things that happen before the customer in this, in this case, the participant in the race, or after the customer. So um, with a shirt, for example, most of those things are going to be before the customer, where the shirt, the, the cotton was grown and transported and harvested and then you know woven and turned into a shirt and then shipped to the printer and then shipped to you. And then after downstream from the customer, it might be as simple as, well, the, you know, the shirt was put in the, put in the landfill instead of recycled, and so is now... Um, not being recycled. So that's kind of the three scopes. And that's how carbon emissions are classified. Before we talked, I kind of classified, I did a little classification of the things that we put in our carbon footprint. And I kind of classified on how visible they are, um, how much of an impact they have, and how difficult they are. So if it's okay with you, I can just kind of do those things. Sure. So race day transportation, like I said, is the biggest thing. Um, it is going to have a very large impact on your carbon footprint. Um, it is also the most challenging to address, and we can kind of get into that a little bit later. And then in terms of visibility, it, I put it kind of as low visibility because people drive all the time. They're probably just not thinking about it that much. The next thing is swag, which for my purposes is uh, mostly finisher medals or finisher items and T-shirts um, and bibs as well. That is kind of medium impact. Um, if you can figure out how to lower your carbon footprint through those, it's kind of medium visibility because people, if you, a shirt feels like a shirt to them, it doesn't necessarily feel like it has lower carbon emissions. And it's, I'd say it's moderately challenging as well. For waste, for your race day garbage and whatnot, um, it has a little bit of a lower impact, but it has very high visibility because if people, people are physically, they have a tangible thing in their hand, a can or a piece of garbage. And they throw it and they know it probably could be recycled, but you don't have a, a, the proper re receptacle, whether it's for compost, recycling, and they throw it in the garbage. And they know that they could probably recycle it, but there's no, it's not, it's, you know, it's just a convenience thing. So, and that I actually think is not very challenging to, um, to address. Um, your race day food, you know, food ha can have a pretty large carbon impact or carbon footprint if it's being, you know, trucked all over the country. So if you're able to get locally grown food, locally made food, that can have a pretty, um, I would say, a moderate impact. It's also moderately visible because people, again, might not be top of mind. And I'd say it's also moderately challenging. Um, and then the last two things I were essentially your, your, your home office, you know, how you're working. I'm assuming most race directors are working from home. I'm sure some people have a, an office they go to if you work for a, a, you know, Chicago marathon or whatnot, but um, there's almost no visibility to it because the runners, they don't know where you work, but it can, over the course of a year, the, the electricity you use at your home can add up to quite a bit or the heating 
And it's not that challenging, at least in my experience, it's been fairly straightforward to work with your power, your electricity supplier to um, ensure that your electricity is coming from a, a green source. And then lastly is shipping. If you're shipping a lot of things, then it's not very hard actually to use a plugin to offset those that the emissions from your shipping. Um, it's not very expensive either. You, if you do it right, you can have pretty good visibility as the person goes, um, you know, they're registering online or, or paying for things online. You can make that pretty visible. And so it, it's not a huge impact, but um, it is easy to do. So that's kind of the things that I, there, there's more to it than that. You, you can definitely go down the rabbit hole of trying to calculate the footprint of everything. But in the end, you kind of need to draw a circle or maybe a foot-shaped um, circle around your company, your race, and decide what's going to be inside it and what's going to be outside of it. And it's probably better to start smaller initially. Um, don't start with everything because it can be really overwhelming. Um, and then as you kind of gain confidence and kind of figure things out, you can increase that footprint size a little bit to take more things into account. Um, but yeah, I would really urge just to, just to start with the transportation, maybe that's going to be the largest single thing and then, and then work outwards from there. Yeah. I think actually that's probably the most important advice. Uh, I think, you know, rabbit hole is, is a great way to put it because, you re particularly when you start going into indirect emissions and all of that stuff, like you can go into like butterfly effect type stuff, right? I mean, where does it end? You know, like anything can indirectly be part of everything kind of thing. But I think if if there's one important lesson here in terms of what you've done, at least practically, is try to go for the big stuff. This kind of like categorization you make across the dimensions of impact, visibility, and how difficult or easy it is to address is really key to be practical about this. Otherwise, I guess it's very easy to 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 just get paralyzed by the scope of this challenge, right? Right. Yeah. You really you need to ask yourself, you know, what things can I actually measure? What things can I get an accurate estimate of? And what can I control? Because things that are outside of your control, it's better not to worry about them right now. Um, and things that you can't even measure, best just not to work, start with that. Start with the things that you can measure. And that you can control and have an impact on. And how many of those things can you really measure? Basically, you know, we're speaking of of this carbon footprint, and I'm thinking it's a number somewhere. I mean, it exists. Is that a number you've calculated for your events? And is it something that people can aspire to do for themselves, that calculation? Yes, absolutely. You, you can. I think that the because most of it's coming from race or transportation, we have... I can I can send this to you. We have a spreadsheet that will allow you to. It's based upon the zip code of the participant where they live, and then the location of the race. And it's going to make some some assumptions about the kind of car you're driving and whatnot. Um, but it will calculate how um, what the average transportation emissions are for a particular race. And so what we did with, with regards to the transportation is that we took that we did that for all the races. And kind of came up with an average amount of emissions across all of our races, all of our participants on average. And that is what we use to, um, yeah, to measure our carbon footprint for the race day transportation, I should say, specifically. Did you come up with a total tons per CO2 equivalent for, for your events? Yes, uh, we did. Um, we Our estimate for all of our 2022 races was... 550 metric tons was the was the estimate and that we also rounded up a little bit because i felt like it was much better to err on the um, side of caution and hopefully maybe be carbon negative as opposed to a little bit of po uh, positive but that was our estimate for all of our races was 550 metric tons and that's for the kinds of stuff that you mentioned you decided would be in scope yes that was transportation for participants and uh, staff shipping that was uh home office operations and there's a fourth category that's just my mind at this point but it was a pretty small aspect and just to circle you asked you know what can you measure and like i said transportation you can measure that um waste you can you can you can weigh how much your garbage is at the race and you can figure out okay well you know we've got a total of 450 pounds of garbage of that or excuse me of waste of that, only 
80 pounds is garbage. So that means that we've diverted, you know, 350 pounds of, of garbage or waste away from the landfill. You can, you can measure that very directly. Shipping is, you can absolutely measure um, very accurately. There's, there's plugins essentially for shipping some, whatever it weighs and where is it going from or where, where it's starting, where is it going? You can accurately calculate the carbon emissions for shipping. Um, swag and food are definitely much going to be much harder to estimate because you just don't have access to all the information. Right. So the things that you decide to uh, basically live out of scope are the things that that you can't estimate well enough. Is that is that sort of like how you split in out of scope things? Yeah, things that we can't really estimate at this point. And things that we don't really have a lot of control over. And I should add at this point that you know, if you if you've got deep pockets, you can pay a company, um, you know, to to very much more accurately measure your carbon footprint. I I had a company, you know, it was going to be ten thousand dollars to do this, and then they knocked it down to five thousand because I was a small business, and we still didn't do it because that was just that's pretty pricey. Um, but just by the price that you can see that it's quite a bit of work goes into it. It's not a um, it's not a small thing. But still, you decided to include travel in your scope of uh, the kinds of things that you look to mitigate, even though you don't have sort of any control over it. I mean, you know, people will travel, right? Yeah, they, they got to come to the race one way or another. Um, they're definitely getting there. So, yeah, we, we cannot control it, but we can certainly incentivize or disincentivize certain behaviors we can make it a little bit easier to to find carpools or to get there in alternate ways. Yeah. So let's talk about those small things that that um, you implemented to try now to reduce the carbon footprint. Once you've identified the things you want to go after and you know what's in scope, out of scope, which is really helpful, otherwise you drown. You've done some really interesting things to actually take that footprint down. And you just mentioned carpooling. I've seen it in some events. I can't imagine how much people go for it is that something that people take up yeah i feel like carpooling is the the white whale of, of race directing race directing uh carbon neutral because it is it is not easy because maybe you have people coming from all over d- different places they might be starting different times if you have different races um or different distances excuse me they might not want to ride with a stranger. They might want to, you know, stay in their car before the race and stay warm. They might want to go get coffee. So that's, you got to recognize that, you know, you're not going to be able to get everybody to carpool or even maybe majority. But the things that we've tried to do is um, to reward carpool behavior. So for example, we have a coffee um, trailer that comes to most of our races. And we've worked it out with them where um, if they carpool, they get a little token and then they bring that token to the coffee truck and they get a free coffee. And that has worked. People like free coffee. You know, they like free stuff, um, especially on race morning. One other thing that we're going to try with a couple of our events in the beginning of 2023 is that we are going to start, uh, I guess, punishing, disincentivizing single occupancy vehicles. So if you show up, and this helps with parking because a lot of times the size of a parking lot is a constraint on our race size. So if you show up uh, by yourself, you have to pay for a parking pass. If you show up with more than one participant in the car, it's free. And so we're going to see how that goes and just um, go from there because it is something that's kind of a new concept. But everybody is familiar with the idea of the HOV lane on a, on a freeway. And so hopefully it kind of works the same way. I think that the grit, the bigger challenge is how do you make it really easy to carpool? You know, figuring out who you're going to ride with and when you're picking up and when um, and where you're meeting uh, right I'm, right now I'm in the process of investigating some apps that are that claim to make this easy um, and we're gonna try them out at, we're gonna we're gonna try whichever one seems best suited to us at a race in 2023 and see how that goes um, we've tried Google sheets in the past where you can say if you're a carpooler and whatnot that hasn't really worked that well the one other thing that we have thought about that is, a little bit intimidating is to essentially have a shuttle service where you're parking, um, where everybody's parking a little bit farther away from the race and there's a shuttle running back and forth continuously. That can definitely be expensive, which is why it's a little intimidating. Those are kind of the things that we're figuring out or trying to figure out right now. And if you know anybody has any ideas for how to make carpooling easy, I'd love to hear them. I've seen those apps. I hope they work out for you because 
I'm pretty sure coordination is a big aspect of this, but still I'm quite surprised. I mean, you're putting on trail races in the Pacific Northwest, which, you know, you would think should be the epicenter of, you know, sustainability awareness and still people get incentivized by a cup of coffee. Like the the benefit alone of just doing it for the sake of it, I guess, is not strong enough an incentive for them. No, I don't think so because people are just, it's just a habit that people are accustomed to, you know, however they get there, they get there. As more and more people have electric vehicles, this will certainly, that will certainly help, but I think that will take quite a few years for that to really, for electric vehicles to be an appreciable percentage of the cars showing up on race day. Yeah. And I guess the other thing, I mean, now thinking about it, that that racers sort of like is the comfort and the security that comes from having all your stuff in your car and driving to the race, right? I mean, I, I can actually think of myself going to a few races and I, and w- even when there is a subtle service, I think of, you know, I, I, you just you just want to take your time and be there. It's it's a it's a difficult thing to pull off. Actually, I can I can see that. One other thing that I would guess is also quite difficult is getting people to not take swag or to go for unconventional type of swag, and that's something you've also tried. I know you were one of the first people to work with um, Trees Not Teas, which is um, a great company. How did that work out? It's been really good. Um, I actually just had a phone call with uh, Jamie from from Trees and Ites yesterday. Um, they're working on a lot of cool stuff. That we've seen the adoption of that, um, where when people register, have the option to receive have a tree planted in their name instead of a T-shirt. So for our road races, that's that's the choice. You get a T-shirt or a tree, and we have anywhere from ten to twenty percent of people for a race opting into that. For our trail races, which had no T-shirt to begin with. What we do instead is we ask them, uh, hey, would you like to pay? Uh, we'll split the cost with you. Do you want to plant a tree for this race? And if they say yes, we pay for half of it. They pay for half of it. And so it's just an add-on there. So that's one way to reduce the amount of T-shirts and swag that you have. One thing that we are trying out, again, at, at our first large race in 2023, is we're trying out a no metal option. So the way that will work is in the registration flow. And, and well, and this is based upon, we've had... Quite a few people say, you know, hey, I've got just the same way with T-shirts. It's like I've got plenty of medals. Um, is no medal option. We've always kind of not done it because we were thinking it was going to be complicated. But the idea we came up with is that we so we use dynamic bib assignment through Run Sign Up. Shout out to the sponsor. And so we're going to have a stamp at bib pickup where if you uh, when you check in on the tablet and it says no medal, the person checking the runner in is going to put that stamp in a nice visible manner on the bib. And then the volunteers at the finish line are going to know, okay, I don't give that person a medal. And then the other part of that is that we're going to start having free medal recycling at all the races um, where we're going to have a bin and you can bring your old medals and you can put them in the bin. And what I do is I, I come to my garage and I cut off all the ribbons and then I take all the medals and I take them to a metal recycling facility. Um, and so I, it, metal recycling is actually, I think, one of the most straightforward things. If you have lots of extra metals after a race, just find the closest metal recycling facility. Um, give them a call. Make sure that they take um, what you've got, which most metals, met, metal metals that we've had are a zinc alloy. So you can tell them that. They can always check, take a look. Um, you can bring one in. They can take a look themselves. And they'll actually pay you for the metal. It's not a ton, but you will get paid. So metal recycling is a great thing. And then shoe recycling. There's actually quite a few. Um, that's another thing we're doing in 2023 is offering shoe recycling at most of our races, where if you've got a couple of pairs of, you know, not trashed, but decently worn um, or decent condition shoes, you can bring them. And we will, there's several services online where they will send you a prepaid uh, bag, you fill the shoes and you ship it out. Um, and you can get paid for that as well. It's not, it's not about the money, but it's, Certainly a nice addition to it. With the no medal option, are you thinking that there would be a different price for people who decide to opt out of the medal? We are not charging a different price. We could, I suppose, do that. But I think that the people that are opting for that, for them, it's not about, you know, saving $2 or $3 or whatever it is. It's just they don't need their medal. And we could, I we did think about the idea of, okay, if you don't get a medal, that means that, you know, we're going to take what we would have spent on the medal you know, $3 and donate to race charity. And that would probably actually incentivize it a little bit more. So maybe we'll make that change as well. That's probably a good thing for me to write down. Yeah, because 
I know having spoken to, and I should say we have a full podcast on Trees Not Teas from back maybe like a year and a half ago, one of our first podcasts we ever did. Chris Zer, who was the, my guest back then, uh, he did mention that you can also do a medal for trees uh, thing. It doesn't have to be a shirt. So you can say, you know, you can have your medal or you can have a tree. And the cost sort of works out pretty, pretty flat, I guess. So you can do like a similar thing. Do you have any idea or like any um, estimate of how many people may choose to go for this? So basically how much of an impact having a no medal option might have? I think that with the road running or road running events, I think it's not going to be a ton of people because I think from a lot of road runners, it's still important to get that medal. We just implemented it last week. So I will have a lot more. I have a much better feeling for that in a month or two. We've had some more registrations. I'm kind of expecting. Maybe, you know, 5%, um, maybe 10% at most, but but certainly probably more around 5%. But I think that every little thing helps. Um, and that is, you know, getting to carbon neutral is really about figuring out what you can do kind of around the edges now, starting small, and then kind of gradually working your way inwards and trying to, instead of trying to tackle it all at once. So if you can reduce the number of t-shirts by 15%, and reduce the number of metals by 5 or 10%, that all those things do add up over time. I hope you're so far enjoying our chat on reducing your race's carbon footprint and getting some good pointers out of it. One really crucial thing to remember with any new initiative you undertake, whether it's on sustainability or anything else, is to make sure to communicate information to participants about what you're doing and how it might affect them and their enjoyment of your race. And that's where the importance of a good email communication system comes in. Now, I've talked before about run signups, built-in tools, and how they integrate with your registration data, which is actually really important, and how they're also free to use. And their fully revamped email marketing platform is no exception. So you can use the run signup native emailing tool to send out all the emails you need to send to your participants for free, however large your participant list. And yes, you get some really nice email templates you can use that are personalized with your participant data, or you can build your own if that's what you want to do. Really, you can do pretty much most things you're already doing on your MailChimp or Constant Contact account. The difference when you choose to do it on Run Signup is you keep all your data in one place and it costs you absolutely nothing. So you can take the money you save by not paying for a separate emailing service and put it towards something else in your race marketing to help grow your event further. So, if you're already a Run Signup customer, do your email marketing from your race dashboard and be done with it. And if you're not, just go to runsignup.com. That's runsignup.com. And check out what a native email marketing tool can do when it works side by side with all your race registration data. Okay, now let's get back to the episode. Well, you mentioned zinc alloy there. So, I guess you're doing the traditional custom metal, you're going down that route. What about um, wooden medals? They seem to be all the rage over the last few years. Lots of trail races do them. Do you have a view on those? Yeah. So I I have a state a state of the art wooden metal uh, fa- factory in my garage. Okay. So for all of our trail races, we do give them a piece of finisher swag. It's not a metal. They tend to be kind of small, um, but it is made of wood. Um, so I have a laser cutter in my garage. So I design um, everything for our trail races, and then we make them right here. And then for our road races, we still do medals made of metal for a lot of our races. But this coming year, we are we are doing at least fifteen percent of our finisher medals will be wood um, made, Raj. And so that's another. It's that's not a huge number, but again, that's something kind of around the edges that you can do to lower it. And so the benefit of a wooden medal is that obviously they weigh a lot less. Anytime you're shipping wood versus metal, it's going gonna, it's gonna to weigh less. Wood is a, rene- a renewable resource, and it's made right here. Yeah, still, I mean, I've received my uh, share of, of uh, wooden medals over the last couple of years. I don't know whether, I've, whether it happened to be on races that didn't think too much. Like, I, I don't know whether there's better wooden medals out there. I have to say, I think, I think wooden medals fill you a little bit feeling wanting more. When I've received them, I was really excited. I was hoping I would like them, and I I don't even like do anything with my medals. I just put them in a in a in a drawer somewhere. But somehow it feels a little bit maybe because of the weight. It just doesn't feel 
a hundred percent satisfying. Yeah, it's absolutely because of the weight. Um, they did they weigh a fraction of what the metal metals weigh. So the way that we kind of compensate for the the, the lightness of the wooden metal is that we kind of try to embellish them. And so what we end up using is um, resin to kind of add some color. Um, it does add some weight as well. Um, I can send some pictures of what we've done in the past. But that resin makes it pop. Um, each one is a little bit different because of the, the way the kind of colors swirl together and whatnot. So um, that's our workaround for the the intangible feeling of a wooden metal somehow feeling less a metal metal right okay so it, it's good to know it's not just me the other thing we do is we don't do we kind of cycle through our races so race a will have a wooden metal this year but not next year and that way we're kind of spreading it out across all the races oh that's an interesting approach that's that's really interesting let's talk a little bit about green electricity what is that for people who are not very familiar with that yeah, so you can get power from uh, a coal or a natural gas-fired power plant, or you can get it from green electricity. And that's generally, in the U.S., that's mostly solar and wind. Uh, other countries, I know, have a lot of geothermal um, sources. Nuclear, I'm sure that you could, there are probably many strong voices on either side saying that it's renewable or not. Um, but here in the U.S., yeah, it's mostly solar and wind. Um, and solar is is probably the best option because that really is something that, a lot of homeowners or home office owners could potentially afford because the cost of solar panels has gone down so much and the cost of electricity just keeps going up and up. So I think that's, if you work from home, which I'm guessing probably you do and you own your home, it's worth getting a quote from an ins- a local installer about having solar panels installed on your home. We are getting some in December and because of the, um, tax incentives around solar panels and because of the sharp increase that's forecasted for electricity, it's going to pay off in about 10 and a half years, which is pretty good. That definitely is a much higher investment um, and it may not be available to everybody, but it's something you can point to in your marketing and your how you're presenting yourself to your runners that, you know, we are all the electricity that we're using um, is green. And maybe this is a good time to talk about um, electricity on race day as well. Because probably, unless you have happen to have outlets, you know, at your race venue, which some venues do have that, which is great, um, you're using generators. And generators are, besides being kind of loud, are stinky. Um, so what you can do is you can purchase these power packs, which is what we've done, and purchase three or four, and you charge them up at home, hopefully using green electricity. And then you bring them to the race. And not only is it, it's not stinky, it's quiet. They're a lot smaller and lighter than generators. And it's been, it's so great at a race is not having that drone of a, of a generator in the background. And then one thing we've actually done is we replaced our inflatable. Because the inflatables do use a lot of power, those fans, we have wooden archways for all of our races now. And um, they look really good and they are not going to ever deflate. And they're not going to get, they're, they're heavier, so they're not going to get blown over by the wind. And uh, yeah, that's something else to consider. That's great. We're going to be going into offsetting actually in a sec. What's roughly the premium you pay for your sort of like green electricity over standard electricity, I guess, just so people have, get an idea of, of the cost involved in that? Yeah, so I've been paying about $20, 20 to $25 a month extra um, for my utility provider to have green electricity come. And once the solar panels are installed, I'll stop paying that, obviously. So it, you know, my electricity bill is anywhere from eighty to ninety dollars. So it ends up being, you know, a hundred to one hundred and ten dollars with the premium. And these are obviously all things that you've taken upon yourself to do because you feel so strongly about sustainability. And and there are things that, in in many ways, in many cases, you have to incur costs uh, over or. You know, like you have to change your ways of doing things. Are there any ways to incentivize or or encourage the participants to do stuff so they help along the way? Because they're a much bigger contributor to to overall carbon emissions to the event than than you probably can ever be. So, do you have any plan for making them work to lower emissions for the event? Well, we don't have a message, people, that is only about carbon neutrality or sustainability but instead we try to put it 
and sprinkle it amongst all of our communication with the runners. So on our website, on our social media, um, in the pre-race and post-race communications, we just kind of try to mention it and also registration flow, um, just to make people more aware of it in general. Aside from the things we talked about with carpooling, we, we haven't, well, there was one, the one other thing that we're doing is that on race day, what we're going to have is, we, it's, it's on the way here, it's called the Zero Waste Station. And what it is, is kind of a, a 10 by 10 canopy with two walls and two tables. So it's kind of this little enclosure. And instead of the people, instead of runners putting their garbage themselves in the receptacle, they're going to put it in a bin on the table. And then somebody who knows where everything goes will put it in the right receptacle. And that way you're making sure that everything is, is actually getting recycled or composted that can be recycled or composted. And all, as well as bibs, you can recycle Tyvek, which is what most bibs are made out of. Um, I realize that's not totally answer to your question, but that's kind of what we figured out so far, I think, with the carpooling and what I mentioned earlier, the parking pass and, and whatnot, race day waste. The point you mentioned, actually, it's something that uh, Bruce, Bruce Rayner from um, Athletes for a Fit Planet also mentioned to me, and it's been a revelation for many people I've discussed this with, which is that you can't allow people to um, do their own sorting of recyclable waste. They, they get it wrong all the time and you end up with contaminated waste all over the place. So it really pays to tell them, leave everything on a table and we'll get the people who know how to sort it to do the sorting. Yes, absolutely. It is pretty confusing what can be recycled and what cannot be recycled. Yeah, I think most people get garbage and they get compost, but uh, recycle is not straightforward. So let's move on actually to um, carbon offsetting, which is another big puzzle for people. We tried to explain it in that episode with, with Bruce on, on exactly how it works, but I, I feel it's, it's a concept that needs repeating. So can you try to explain to people what carbon offsetting is about and how it works sort of at a high level? Yeah. Carbon offsetting, the concept is that you emit carbon to the atmosphere and to offset that, to bring your net amount to zero, you can spend money on a marketplace. And it is a marketplace because there are many different projects, there's different prices, and you can you can purchase an offset to either actually uh, capture carbon from the atmosphere. So you could put you could buy a ton of emissions from a project that will actually remove carbon dioxide from the air, or you can put that money towards a project that will um, avoid emitting carbon. So um, in the future, essentially, and their, you know, their, their effect is the same, but I think that mentally there is, they do feel a little bit differently where you're actually removing, actively removing carbon versus simply avoiding emissions in the future. And so by calculating your carbon footprint and then buying the appropriate amount of offsets, you can bring your carbon footprint, your measured carbon footprint, to, to zero or even to negative if you want to go a little above and beyond. It's sort of like carbon accounting in a way, right? Totally, yes. It's, it's like saying that I cannot do anything on the liability side of my carbon emissions, but I can buy some credits in which have been generated by someone not emitting that similar amount of, of carbon somewhere else. And that's sort of net net because we all live in the same planet, I guess. It has a similar effect, right? Right. Yeah. You can go with ones that are really local or you can go with ones that are, you know, around the globe from you, but the effect is the same. You know, it's all going into the same atmosphere and it's, it's not like, I think it's, I think that there is kind of a preference towards a local project because people feel like it is, you know, somehow benefiting your local area. But I think it's important to consider ones that are international or far away from you. Um, because they may be they may be better in some way, um, and even though it feels somehow less impactful, it it's all the same. It's, a, it's only one planet, so it's all going to the same atmosphere. And obviously, the the elephant in the room in all this, which is very difficult to mitigate, which is where offsetting comes in, is participant travel. Yes. Yeah. How does that work exactly? Sort of like walk us through how offsetting participant participant travel would work okay so like i said earlier we calculated our carbon footprint to be 550 metric tons so at the beginning of this year i worked with um there's quite a few companies out there that do this um the one i worked with is called south pole they're a large 
carbon offsetting company. They're based in Switzerland. And I worked with them to find and select a project. Um, the one we ended up going with was a wind turbine um, farm in North or South Dakota. And so this is an example of a project that is avoiding emissions. So I, I we bought the we bought the offsets, and that money is used to um, pay back. You know, building a wind farm obviously is expensive, and so um, that money is used to pay back the installation costs. And because it's a wind farm, it's not burning coal, and so it's it, it's avoiding the emissions that would have come from a fossil fuel powered um, electricity plant. That's that's one example. And I think that honestly, if I was to go about it now, I would probably consider a different project now that I've, because I've been learning a lot about this over the past year. And I selected that project because it was in the United States. Um, the price was decent. It wasn't the cheapest, but it was not the most expensive either. Um, but now knowing that there are so many examples of projects that, um, might either be much lo- much more local to our races or might be better in some way. Um, and when I say better, I, there's two things that I think of. One is there are certain projects you can do where not only are they avoiding carbon emissions, but they might also be improving the health of the local inhabitants, and it might also be stimulating the economy. So the example I like to use is if there is a, a village somewhere in a developing economy country, and people are using wood to cook their their food and heat their homes. If you can uh, burning that wood, it's not very efficient. It produces a lot of smoke, um, which is obviously bad for whoever's in the house. If you can replace that open fire stove, open fire camp fire with a high efficiency stove, it's still burning wood. It's going to use a lot less wood and produce a lot less smoke. Um, and that's an of you know avoiding it, reducing the emissions, but also you know, improving the health of the local, uh, of whoever is doing the burning. So that's a good example. And then the other thing I think of with, with a, a good, uh, maybe superior product is, like I mentioned to you earlier, there are projects that will actually remove um, carbon from the air. And I know that Trees Not Teas, one of their big projects is called biochar, which is essentially like a fancy kind of charcoal that is improves the soil of wherever it is and will also suck in carbon for years and years to come. Um, and so that's one thing that they've kind of gone big on and has that secondary benefit of improving the soil. And beyond the selection of the project itself, I guess you need to you need to start by, um, you need to calculate how much carbon you want to be offsetting, let's say from travel. And then you need to select the project, go to those companies and they will take care of basically, so you buy the credits and those get sort of like ripped, ripped up. So, so no one can use them again. How, how does that work basically? Yeah. So it's kind of my impression of the carbon offsetting marketplace. It's kind of all over the place because there are, you know, it's things that are very sketchy, some things that are very, you know, there's no, there's not a lot of trust behind it versus the very highly verified. And so the way, what you want to look for, there's two important things. One is you want to make sure there's a third party verification in place. So that means, so the the worst kind of carbon offsetting, I think would be you're paying some dude in a forest and he's next to a tree and he's like, Hey, I was going to cut this tree down, but because you gave me, you know, 10 bucks. And then he, he could tell that to a hundred people and resell that same, you know, that same carbon offset a hundred times. Right. There's no, there's no variation. And it's like, the tree's already there. It's not like it was going to get cut down. Nobody's got to cut it down. You're just holding the tree hostage to, to make money versus having third-party verification where, you know, you're, there's some project, whether it's a power plant, like a, a solar, a, a wind turbine farm or um, methane capture or something where it's in place. There's a third party who's coming out to verify that everything's being done, that said it's being done. And so they, and so you will see there on some marketplaces, there will be third party verification. And then the other thing to look for is that make sure there's kind of a buffer because a lot of the times um, the buffer is, should be about, you know, 10% of the overall project. And that buffer is both for, as I understand it is both for the, is offsetting, um, 
the creation of that project. So the transportation or whatever went into the creation of that project. And then it's also accounting for, you know, hiccups along the way, basically. So if it's a forest, if, if for example, if the offset you're buying is um, based around trees in a forest, that 10% might account for any forest fires that happen along the way. That's an example of kind of that buffer. And that's just kind of an insurance policy against whatever might happen. So third-party verification and a buffer are the two things you want to look for in an offset. And in the case of participant travel, which again, we focus on because it is the uh, biggest contributor to all this from, from, from a race point of view, what's the typical cost per participant, you know, on average, I guess for your kind of race, because, you know, like different races have a different profile of where people fly in for. There's more local races, more kind of like international races, but what kind of cost are we looking at typically to offset participant travel? Yeah. So for us, which I don't think we have very many people traveling across the country. Most of our people live within, most of our runners live within, you know, an hour drive at most. But for us, it worked out to a cost of 95 cents per runner, uh, which is not that much. So the way that we handled this is that we use run sign up to create an additional fee in the registration. So it's, it's a carbon offset fee. And so when people get to the checkout page, they'll see the race registration fee, the you know processing fee, and then a carbon offsetting of 95 cents. And so we collect all that money over the course of a year, and then we use that to buy the offset. And so, and we had this, we've had that in place for, I don't know, nine or 10 months. And we have had one person complain about it object to the 95 cents but other than that we've had no no complaints about it was the objection i'm just curious that this person was sort of like living next to the start line and he he wasn't too keen on subsidizing people coming from further out or no it was purely about like how dare you charge me 95 cents i don't i don't want to have my race transportation offset i see okay and i know actually because i i looked this up before before the podcast uh, I was just going back on some old uh, group posts on Facebook. That's the Race Directors Hub, our, our Race Directors group there, that you were toying with the idea of actually allocating the cost by actual distance rather than charging people the flat 95 cent fee. Is that still an ambition? I would love to do that. I would love, we were kind of deep in talks with Run Sign Up and the company called Cloverly, which um, has a software that allows you to calculate um, transportation of anything from one point to another. And the goal was to have an API between the two um, softwares where it would instantaneously calculate, oh, you live in this town and the race is here. This is your carbon offset. And so it would the idea being that it would either require or give them the option to then offset it. Unfortunately, you know, Run Sign Up didn't want to do that because apparently I was the only person really asking for that. So does anybody listening who uses Run Sign Up and wants to help me put some pressure on Run Sign Up to do this? Please get in touch because I would love to do that. I think it would be very cool, and honestly, it would make people probably a lot more cognizant of if they do live far away. It's like, oh my, I'm going to emit 85 pounds of carbon by driving to this race that's you know kind of farther away, um, and just kind of have that be at the front of their mind. Yeah, and I think as you say the more important thing probably there is the awareness, right? It, it's it's being able to tell people, particularly the high polluting people, like the furthest traveling people, that your CO2 equivalent cost for offsetting your travel to the event is maybe $3 in your case, whereas for someone else might be 10 cents or something. It's, it's building, I think, that awareness, which is really key. On the other hand, it's really encouraging that even if you, even if you charge a flat fee of just the $1, People still end up taking it. I think. I think it's it's great that very few people would sort of like complain about that, which is pretty good. You mentioned Cloverly, so this is what it, it, that's sort of like a service that calculates the carbon associated with different activities. Does it offset it for you? What does it do exactly? Yeah, Cloverly is a a tool, a, a company as well. Their primary use case is for mailing and shipping things. So if you tell it. Hey, I've got a box. It weighs 10 pounds. It's this size and it's going from Seattle to New York City. It will tell you exactly um, how much the carbon emissions for that. And then it could also automatically charge you to offset it. So we use that for shipping um, 
when people buy something from us, we use Cloverly to offset the shipping. And it is very inexpensive because packages are, it's, it's pretty efficient, you know, for most of our packages, about 10 to 20 cents. Um, so it's not a lot. Um, but it can also, Cloverly can handle other things. It can handle driving from one place to another. So that was what we were going to use in connection with Run Sign Up. And I would still love to use um, if, if Run Sign Up is listening. Some some people um, at Run Sign Up are listening. And I'm sure, I mean, they have a very long feature list, but I'm, I'm sure it's up there because I know they also quite feel quite strongly about this. One area that doesn't get mentioned all that often in this discussion, and I insist on bringing up, is the business side of all this. And we've touched on the cost of all this quite a lot. It, it's an expensive thing, or it can be fairly expensive, to try and cover this cost as a race director, right? And, and I think it's great for you going out of your way to do that, but it somehow feels that it, it feels like there should be contributions in lifting that burden from more people. I mean, the participants is an obvious one. We mentioned you put some of that participant travel cost on them. I'm hoping there's more support out there, potentially financial support, even from government or other agencies in helping you become a more greener event director. Is that the case in the U.S.? You know, that's one thing I haven't done much on. I haven't really pursued, you know, the availability of grants or funding um, to help with this. I know that there are tax incentives for things like solar panels um, and other, you know, green things. Um, but that is probably the next logical step for me to do is kind of, because I, I, I think that I'm pretty lucky in that our company is mature enough where I can kind of take a step back from day-to-day race directing duties and focus on things like this. Um, it does come at the expense, you know, you can only do so many things. There's only so many hours in the day. It's something that matters a lot to me. And I hope that it matters a lot, or maybe after listening to this, you know, you care more, the listener. Um, but I am lucky in that I can kind of focus on this and there is a, a, a time cost and a financial cost. The single largest cost is definitely the offsets, which in our case, you know, we've been able to pay for all of it with that 95 cent charge, which is great. Um, but things like power packs, the zero way station, going cupless at races, for example, that's another easy thing to do. And a lot of races are doing it, but you have to buy those reusable cups. They're not free. So it does, it does cost money. But my hope is that, you know, by educating your runners, your, your, your customers with this, um, and making them more aware of it and then emphasizing that you are really working hard to make your race environmentally friendly that over time, you know, you will attract more and more customers and kind of reap the rewards of the investment of time and energy and money into all these things. Yeah. With more, with more customers. Do you feel actually that kind of like soft marketing benefit could be meaningful for, for events in terms of, I guess, offsetting some of that cost that events pay in higher popularity for their events, or even the ability to pass on some of those fees to the participant being able to charge a kind of like sustainability premium? Yeah, absolutely. I think that personally we have raised our prices, um, you know, most years and we've had very little pushback on it um, because people that are passionate about running are going to, are going to sign up, I think. And like I said earlier at the beginning, you know, our numbers were down only about 5% compared to 2019. I don't, I have no idea how much of that is, can I can attribute to our efforts around sustainability, but I, I know that we are doing well. And I think that part of that is, is based upon these efforts. And I, we do, you know, we get emails, we get messages. People do seem to appreciate the efforts that we're making around, around recycling, around offsetting, around making these races just a little better. And I'm guessing it's not only the participants, right? I guess you're making your race more appealing to volunteers. You're making your race more appealing to local communities um, and potentially even sponsors. I was this idea of so-called sustainability sponsor. I'm not sure it's it's a it's a term. It's like an official term, but keeps keeps coming up in my discussions with people, where you get someone to come in a company uh, which they call a sustainability sponsor, and and they're there to actually sponsor that cost of making your race greener. So so they're in specifically for that thing. I know in my discussion with Brian Smith 
of uh, P3R, they mentioned that about about their about Pittsburgh Marathon and some of their races. Is that something that you've done or thought of doing or come across at all? Well, I will say that uh, we had or we are in the process of signing an agreement with a sponsor, and they, they're not coming on as a sustainability sponsor. But when they they reached out to us and they said we really admire your company, especially your devotion to sustainability, and there's there's dollars coming in from them or that are going to come in. And I can very directly point to and say, we're getting this money because this company admired our sustainability. Um, going after other sponsors to be a sustainability sponsor, I think it's a great idea, especially, for example, the, the zero waste station or the coupless aspect. That's a very tangible, which I think is a great opportunity to have some, some co-branding with that sponsor, um, where if they're getting that reusable cup it's got the sponsor's name on it, and um, that's a great way to get the sponsor's name out there or on that zero waste station, which I think that throwing, putting your garbage, getting it recycled or composted is kind of a feel good, maybe not warm and fuzzy, maybe it's kind of green and fuzzy, but um, that's a, that would be an excellent opportunity to offset the cost of buying the tent and the tables and whatnot, and then maybe paying for somebody to be there sorting with a sustainability sponsorship. Yeah, and I think one of the uh, absolutely, I think I think the zero waste, the recycling station is a great is a great place to put them, and and I think the good thing about the sustainability sponsor is that it opens up your sustainability prospects as a race to people that might be less willing to commit if they're not native to the space. So we're not talking about you know like the apparel companies or the running shoe companies and stuff. You know, you go to a bank, let's say a local bank. It might be a lot better for them, particularly as attitudes shift in society, to tell them you can be associated with our recycling efforts and we're going to put your branding up there. And I think it offers great opportunities to, to not just force people into being sponsors, but just to allow them to ease themselves into sponsoring races, people who, who may not traditionally come into that kind of space. Right. Yeah. For somebody like a bank, it might be a little bit difficult to figure out how to how to insert themselves into a race. But zero waste station, for example, is a is an easy I think it's an easy sell. Absolutely. So you sound like someone who's um, very passionate about this. I think if there's anything clear from this episode, that's definitely that. Can people reach out to you potentially with questions. You've done so much stuff on that. If they need any help or any direction or even to share a comment about some of the things we've discussed. Yes, please reach out to me. My email is porter, like the, the beer or the, uh, the hotel employee, you know, who carries your stuff at orca, like the animal running.com. And I would love to talk more. If you've got ideas or have questions or anything, I'd love to talk to you more. Awesome. And you're, of course, uh, very active in our Race Directors Hub group. And if anything comes up there, you're very keen to um, helping people. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you a lot for uh, coming back on the on the podcast. Uh, I hope people found this helpful. So thank you very, very much for your time, Porter. Thank you so much, Panos. And thanks to everyone listening in. I hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you all on our next podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode on carbon neutral race production with Blackfish Ventures, Porter Bratton. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com. You can also share your thoughts about race sustainability or anything else in our Facebook group, Race Directors Hub. Many thanks again to our awesome podcast sponsor, Run Sign Up, for sponsoring today's episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite player. And check out our podcast back catalog for more great content like this. Until our next episode, take care and keep putting on amazing races.